When I was a child, I heard a song. The song started life as a poem. It was about a road, a woman, and an unrequited love. In the song, the singer sang the words of the heart-grieving poet. The words were not his own, but the singer brought the emotion to them as if the song had been inscribed on the walls of his own heart. This song was Raglan Road, the poet was Patrick Kavanagh and the singer was Luke Kelly. Hearing this as a child was the first time I listened to music. I had heard songs before. They were on the radio, on the TV and in the backgrounds of life. To this point in my life I had not been encapsulated by the sound of a voice telling a tale. This was the first time I really listened to the song. I didn't have a choice. Luke forced me to travel up and down each octave he dictated and navigated. The words didn't mean much to me. I was only a child. What did I know of life? But his voice made me understand all the pain the poet felt without ever having lived it. I often wonder, maybe, although he didn't write the words himself, did Luke mean every one of them? It certainly felt to me as though he did. Before Luke, a Limerick lady stole the imagination of the world in a similar way through her voice. The difference being, however, there is no doubt, she understood, meant and lived every word that left her mouth on the day the world came to know her. This is her story. In 1818, in number 4, Patrick Street, Limerick, a child was born. Her name was Catherine Hayes. Catherine was born into an Anglo-Irish family who were humble in their finances and manner. Catherine's father, Arthur, was known to be a gifted but unsuccessful musician. Her mother, Mary, kept the home and made it a safe and loving space for Catherine and her three siblings. When Catherine was just five years old, Arthur chose to abandon his family in the hope of freedom and he left the family in poverty. Catherine and her siblings were forced to grow up quickly to take on some of the responsibilities of the home and try best they could to struggle through life. Although times were tough, Catherine found comfort in singing. As she cleaned the house, hung up washing or did the dishes, her voice could always be heard. When Catherine came of age to work, she transferred her efforts in the home to the home of the Earl of Limerick, who hired her to help with the upkeep of his house. Here, Catherine continued to sing as she worked and was often encouraged to do so by those she worked for and with. One day, as Catherine casually sang in the Earl's garden as she performed some chores, she attracted the ears of the next door neighbour. He walked towards the wall between them and listened to her sing. His name was Edmund Knox and he was the local Church of Ireland bishop. As Edmund listened, he found himself taken away by Catherine's voice. As he kneeled down and leant against the wall, his mind's eye had been taken by Catherine to a land far away. Her voice both soothed and wowed him.
Inspired by her natural talent, Edmund took a box from the kitchen and used it to prop himself up on the wall. Excuse me, he shouted. Catherine got an awful fright. She turned around to give out to him for scaring her until she realised who it was. Knowing Edmund was a man of power, she quickly discarded her want to scold him for scaring her. Yes, can I help you sir? Catherine asked. You are brilliant, truly remarkable, Edmund stated. He inquired where she had learned to sing like that, what choir she was a part of and how much did she make from her singing. He was astounded to learn that Catherine had never been taught how to sing, she was not part of any choir and she only sang for her own recreation. Edmund quickly stated that this was all to change, a voice like Catherine's could not be kept from the world. Edmund sought out the wealthy families of Limerick and encouraged them to fund Catherine's voice. He also put pressure on the best voice school in the area to train her properly. As her popularity grew, Catherine was invited on a number of occasions to perform for the Protestant ascendancy around Limerick as they entertained their wealthy friends. She would sing in the corners as a background noise as they discussed issues such as their wealth and property value. But most found Catherine was too special to not stop and be captured by her as she sang. Soon many of these parties became private unplanned concerts. Upon witnessing this for himself, Edmund knew that Catherine should not be held back by her circumstances in life. The world was out there and it was waiting to hear her voice. He went to Dublin to visit those who knew about music and the arts and sought their advice on how he could best help the world hear Catherine. It soon became clear that she should move to Dublin and train under Antonio Sapio. The wealthy families of Limerick pooled their money together and funded Catherine and her mother to move to Dublin to perfect her voice. For three years she was coached by Antonio himself, who was an Italian composer and conductor. In her time training with him, Catherine and her mother lived in number one Percy Place, Dublin. It was a far cry from the poverty they were used to. After just a few months training with Antonio, Catherine was informed that she was to make her debut in front of an audience. Catherine assumed this meant she was to be included in the choir and both she and her mother were delighted that she was going to be up on stage at a major event, even if it was just to be a member of a large choir. Baby steps are part of the process. Or rather, they normally are. Catherine felt sick to her stomach when Antonio corrected her assumption. She was not to be just a member of the choir. She was to accompany him in a duet in front of a full house at what is now the Gate Theatre in Dublin. The 20-year-old Catherine stole the show as she sang Or Peppered Pipe from Joan of Arc. When the singing stopped, the audience fell silent for a moment wondering what they had just witnessed, before erupting into an almighty standing ovation. Catherine had arrived. The 
following year, Catherine returned to the stage in Limerick at the Swinburne's Great Rooms at the request of Edmund. When word went out she was returning to Limerick for a show, tickets sold out almost immediately as the people of Limerick were so excited to welcome Catherine home and to hear her voice. Again she wowed them all. For the next few months Catherine continued performing around Dublin. As her fame grew, so did the price to book her. In 1841, Catherine was invited to sing in the long rooms in Rotunda, where she was to perform for the famed Hungarian pianist Franz Liszt. Franz left the show amazed by Catherine's voice and began to tell other European musicians about the Limerick Lady in Dublin. Such was his influence that musicians from far and wide came to witness the voice for themselves. Luigi Lablache came to Dublin in 1841 and met with Antonio to ask about Catherine. Luigi was amazed with how highly Antonio spoke of his student and requested that he hear her for himself. Catherine was summoned to perform for Luigi. She entered the room nervous, holding her mother's hand. And with tears streaming down her mother's face from both nerves and pride, Catherine sang for Luigi. When she finished, Luigi did not speak to her. He immediately turned to Antonio and told him the world needed to hear Catherine's voice. He turned back to where Catherine and her mother stood and explained that she was bigger than Dublin and the whole world was waiting to hear her. He instructed her to go to Paris to train under Manuel Garcia and he would ensure Manuel would accept her. Catherine's hopes were dashed, however, when the issue of financing the training came up. Manuel was one of the best in the world with a price to match his reputation. When the plan looked dead and buried, the people of Limerick rallied around her. They organised a farewell concert where she would perform. It was a sellout. All the fees were waived by those who helped. Catherine's mother collected all the money, stitched it into the side of Catherine's jacket, and together they boarded the boat for France. For two years, Catherine trained with Manuel as she lived in Paris. She lived in an apartment on Rue St. George with other aspiring musicians, poets and artists. After her two years of training, Manuel felt he had taught her all he could and recommended she move to Milan to train under Felice Ronconi. Ronconi was delighted to take Catherine on as his student as her reputation was now going before her. She did not disappoint. On the 10th of May 1846, Catherine exploded into the world as she performed in the Italian Opera House. When she finished, the crowd is said to have given one of the most enthusiastic standing ovations ever seen in Italy. People began coming from all over Italy and Europe to hear her sing, and on one occasion she was recalled to the stage 12 times for an encore.
On the night of the Twelve Encores, there was a man in the crowd called Giuseppe Verdi. Giuseppe was an Italian opera composer and he wanted her to be the lead in his new opera. Catherine agreed to this and together they toured Italy where Catherine sang and acted. As she toured with this opera, influential people from across Europe came to witness her voice for themselves. One of whom was a member of the Royal Family of England who requested that the brilliant Catherine perform for Queen Victoria. This was at a time when Queen Victoria was refusing to give any real aid to the Irish dying in the Great Catholic Genocide in Ireland, also referred to as the Great Famine. Instead of providing help, she was exporting food from the island to keep herself and her friends living lives of power and luxury. Catherine was conscious of this and she was very hesitant to perform. However, it was a part of her contract with the opera and she was forced to perform in London for the Famine Queen. The Queen was wowed by Catherine and asked for an encore. Catherine initially refused as she was only contracted to do the opera and she did not want to do anything favourable for the Queen. Then word came through that nobody would be paid unless the Irish girl did as she was told. There was a rustle of the curtains and the Queen watched as the Limerick Lady moved the heavy curtains out of her way and walked to the edge of the stage. The crowd sat in silence and the musicians didn't pick up their instruments. Then in the silence of the room, with a grin on her face, Catherine began to sing unaccompanied. The song she sang had not been heard by the ears of the British wealth until this point. In Buckingham Palace, in front of those who were watching on as Catherine's friends and family suffered at home, she sang the Irish rebel song, Kathleen Mavourneen. Kathleen Mavourneen, the grey dawn is breaking. The horn of the hunter is heard on the hill. The lark from her light wing, the bright dew is shaking. Kathleen Mavourneen, what's slumbering still? Oh, have you forgotten how soon we must sever? Oh, have you forgotten this day we must part? It may be for years and it may be forever. Oh, why are you silent, thou voice in my heart? It may be for years and it may be forever. Then why are you silent, Kathleen Mavourneen? Kathleen Mavourneen, awake from thy slumbers. The blue mountains glow in the sun's golden light. Ah, where is the spell that once hung on my slumbers? Arise in thy beauty, thou star of my night. Mavourneen, Mavourneen, my sad tears are falling. To think that from Erin and thee I must part. It may be for years and it may be forever. Then why are you silent, thou voice of my heart? It may be for years and it may be forever. Then why are you silent, Kathleen Mavourneen? The Queen was outraged, but the story of this act of defiant bravery reached the Irish in America, Canada, Australia and New Zealand, 
and rumours of the event spread across Britain. Across these nations, the Irish began singing the song in solidarity for the Lady Rebel from Limerick. Catherine went back to Italy to sing for a time and it wasn't until 1851 when she was invited back to sing in Britain. She didn't spend long here as she was soon invited by businessman William Avery Bushnell of Connecticut to go to America where the Irish were awaiting their hero. She agreed and joined the former manager of Jenny Lind, a world-renowned Swedish opera singer, in a tour of America. She performed in Boston, Toronto, Philadelphia, Washington, Charleston and 50 other cities. Along her journey, she met businessmen, presidents and other leaders of the New World. She explained to each of them of the suffering of the Irish back at home and requested help to raise the people from their knees under the heavy weight of the crown. P.T. Barnum then sponsored Catherine's tour of California, where she was listed as the Swan of Erin and the Hibernian Prima Donna. The newspaper Far West News wrote of her debut at San Francisco's American Theatre in 1852 that long and loud were the cheers and applause which greeted her entree. She acknowledged again and again the enthusiastic testimonial and again and again the audience cheered and applauded. It was while standing at the footlights amid the storm of applause that our citizens had the first view of Miss Catherine Hayes. Miss Hayes is about 30 years of age. She is a graceful, queen-like person of medium stature with a fair oval face. Her features are regular, hair bright auburn, eyes blue, and her face wears an intellectual expression without much animation. She dresses with taste and her manner is perfectly easy and self-possessed, her gesticulation appropriate and graceful. After her tour of North America, Catherine then set off to the Irish in South America. She toured the Irish areas for a time and then set off again, this time to the Irish in Australia. She was welcomed into Sydney with great open arms by the people. Her headline show was at the Queen Victoria Theatre. In a further act of rebellion against the Queen, she did not sing opera songs. Instead, she sang ballads like Home Sweet Home and Oh Steer My Bark to Erin's Isle. She dedicated the show to all those the Queen had banished from Ireland during the famine years. She toured Australia and then headed to Asia for a time. Catherine returned to England in 1856. She had made a fortune on her tours but had lost some of it due to poor investments. She married William Avery Bushnell although the marriage didn't last long as he died of illness at the age of 35. After his death Catherine lost much of her motivation to perform and toned down her appearances. She continued to sing around London and in nearby towns, but without the enthusiasm she once had for her craft. At the age of 43, Catherine joined her husband in the afterlife. The music for this episode was written, performed and produced by myself, Ryan O'Halloran. The story was researched and scripted by Oren. If you want to help support this podcast, you can buy us a coffee at www.buymeacoffee.com forward slash we the Irish or leave us a review on your podcast app. Ryan Isanam Dom, Gurav Mahagut, Slonanish.